Good morning. Um, you might want to think of this as part two of Steve's talk because it's the same general subject and uh, we've been working together quite a lot in the last few months. So before I start talking more about um, these mobile devices, um, most of the subject material that I'm covering in this talk is based on a, um, a single product that's currently available. It's called the Mobile Molecular Data Sheet and that's produced by my company which is called Molecular Materials Informatics. And this app has been uh, it's available for BlackBerry smartphones and all of the Apple devices, so that's uh, iPhones, iPods, and iPads. Now, um, this talk is kind of a bit like a feature, feature review, but uh, I want you to think of it more like just a, a, a tour of things that are actually possible on these mobile devices. So I want to sort of um, demonstrate that a lot of things that can be done right now and uh, maybe get you thinking about some um, more progress that we can make in this area. So we all know that uh, Kim Informatics basically got rolling on desktop class device uh, computers. And uh, these days there's a fair bit of server-side software and there are quite a few web interfaces. Most of them are pretty simple. Um, but if we start thinking about how to move some of the software over to these ultra-mobile devices that are popping up everywhere, um, there are two basic conclusions that we can uh, arrive at. And one is that these devices in the last few years, they're really powerful. I mean, this is a fully powered computer that you can carry around with you and use for up to 10 hours on a battery. Um, but the other conclusion is, is a bit more tricky and that the user interface is really very different to what we're accustomed to on a desktop or laptop. And one of the major problems for making anything work in the chem informatics field is that there are very large proportion of um, applications where we need to be able to draw molecules. Sometimes we need to draw them pretty well for uh, publication purposes. And as you can see in this um, picture here, in this oversized um, picture of my, my finger, it's really pretty huge relative to um, as this little iPod sized screen. And so if you're, you're all accustomed to drawing molecules pretty quickly and efficiently using a traditional mouse pointer based um, software application on a desktop. And this, these ideas really just do not translate to a mobile device. You just can't use your, your large uh, obscuring finger to position the, the atoms and molecules in the same way. So we have to come up with a, a way to get around this limitation. And uh, one, of, one approach that we can take is essentially uh, consider all of the drawing operations that we need to do. Everything we need to accomplish in order to draw uh, a presentation quality 2D structure diagram quickly. And if we do this, if we sit down and, and give it some thought, it's actually possible to come up with a list of primitives that can achieve all of these functions without ever actually requiring the user to position anything on the screen in an accurate way, or positioning at all, in fact. And I'm actually going to go over this um, just in about four slides. So it's going to be a very, very brief overview of some pretty complex algorithms. Uh, and that's, I can afford to do that because this is all published in the literature. So if you look up Journal of Cheminformatics, uh, Volume 2, Article 8, all of this, uh, the next, next few slides are explained in a great deal of detail. So the very, very concise overview is the, the procedure that we go through for drawing structures is that we select some number of atoms and bonds and we pick which action we want to do and the underlying algorithm will interpret your, your starting structure, your selection, and your, your menu uh, choice, and it will propose a solution, or in some cases, more than one solution. And for the most part, that's, um, if you choose wisely, that's going to be the thing that you actually want to accomplish. And in order to, to, to do this, we need a fair, fairly large collection of primitives, and these, are, these can be quite daunting for the, um, the initial user, and I apologize for that, but this is... Um, this is a powerful set of um, drawing tools, but luckily they are uh, arranged at least in a fairly logical way. For it. So, for example, there are tools for defining bonds and geometry. There are a lot of tools for changing the atom types. You can see these have a lot in common. Um, there are also tools for moving around um, atoms and so on that you already have and selection, and there's a whole lot of templates, which I'm, I'm going to get to in a moment. So uh, one, of the one end of the scale is the, the bread and butter of actually drawing structures, the, the easy parts, is based on the, the idea that I'm, I'm sure you all know very well that when you're drawing a new bond from an existing structure, for the most part, it's really pretty easy to predict the, the most common geometries that people want. It's simply a matter of existing bond uh, angles and hybridization. So generally, you can, you can um, automate a lot of this 
uh, if you don't have the luxury of actually specifying positions, you can usually guess where a user wants to actually draw a new bond. And these primitives are all basically layered in a, in a series of increasing complexity. So um, one layer down, for instance, you may have to specify the actual geometry that you want if it's slightly more unusual. And so that's the, um, that's the key design for these primitives. The, the more simple and common and routine the thing that you want to accomplish, the less times you're actually going to have to touch your mobile device in order to get it. And so at the other end, you can create a new atom and nudge it around the screen all you want, which is going to take a while. But the, the, the key value here is to, to make, make all, of this, uh, all of these drawing operations very simple and very, very fast once you get used to these primitives. A very, very major part of the drawing process is based on intelligent use of structured templates. And uh, basically, the way this works is that you have a starting structure, you select some number of atoms or bonds, and you pick a template that you want to attach onto it. And the algorithm will then go through and generate a, um, a selection of proposed grafted-on structures. And so the, the, um, of these uh, potential structures that it generates, it then uh, picks out the unique ones and ranks them in order of the things that you're most likely to actually want. So you know, it'll do things like avoiding pentavalent carbons or geometries that are uh, too constrained and so on. And for the most part, you do get the um, result that you're looking for and as the first result, but you, if not, you can step through the list of proposed candidates and pick the one you like. Uh, so there, there are quite a few. Um, this slide really does encapsulate a, a huge amount of um, work in the background. Um, but the, there are two main categories, and one that um, for a regular template, let's say benzene, uh, fusing to one atom is, is usually either done by overlaying a single atom or uh, by a bridged fusion mode. And if you selected bonds, for example, it does a bond join or multiple atoms, it'll try all of the different possible alignments and propose those as solutions. A fair few of the templates also have uh, what's called a guide atom. So that's this little X notation here. And this is really handy for uh, common terminal groups. So it's, it's used as a strong clue as to how you want the template attached onto your current structure. And this is actually, it's more than just useful for things like chelate structures. It's really the only way to um, specify exactly how this particular template is going to be uh, fused onto your, your starting structure. Okay, so just a reminder, uh, if, if any of this actually interests you, Journal of Cheminformatics, Volume 2, Article 8. It's all there. Now, just to delve deeper into this, this template thing, um, if you're trying, trying to draw a highly symmetrical structure like, say, this trimesothylphosphine, you can take advantage of the fact that this app uses the clipboard as a kind of a temporary template, a transient template. And so when you paste it back in, it'll use the same um, fairly complex uh, template placement methods. So, for instance, if you, uh, if you want to draw the structure, you can start by drawing phosphorus and the first substituent. If you select that substituent and copy it, it'll notice that there's a bond disconnect here, and it'll generate a guide atom in the, in the temporary clipboard holder. So when you paste it back in, it will know to reattach the template in the same way and, and once again for the third substituent. So th this is an example of something you probably wouldn't bother with with a normal um, desktop sketcher where you have a mouse. You can probably click faster than, in, in less time than it would take to actually think about how to do this. But with a mobile device, this, the, the parameters are quite different. The user inter interaction is a lot slower, so you have more time to think about what you're doing, and it makes a lot more sense to take advantage of, of what the algorithm can do in the background rather than just specifying it manually. Um, everything I've described up until now, these primitives were actually designed for uh, originally for a Blackberries with just a trackpad, so you don't even need a mouse, uh, a touchscreen at all. However, if you do have a touchscreen, there are all kinds of um, handy gesture shortcuts that you can um, make use of. And one of maybe the most important one is the one shown on the left. Um, you can use your finger to enter traversal mode so you can walk the selection across atoms and bonds. And when it will also generate um, projected positions for potential new bonds that aren't there yet. And if you take your finger off, it will create that bond. So it basically means you can swipe your finger and create a new methylene, and it's a very fast way to build up chain structures. And also for selection mode, you can't really see this very well, but... Uh, it's the equivalent of the, the lasso mode that you often find in, in mouse-based drawing packages. But rather than a, a narrow, precise rope, you have a big blobby thing, which is kind of like a crayon, so you color in the atoms that you want. It's just a more appropriate user interface idea for these devices. 
And there are also context selection menus and all, all kinds of other shortcuts that can be done. So that, um, that covers drawing very quickly. Um, so we want to um, make this a bit more sophisticated so we can um, think about putting these together in some kind of a collection, which we'll call a molecular data sheet. And this is basically just a, a fairly standard template, um, table type structure. It has rows and columns, and the columns are strongly typed, so one of the types is a molecule. And so once we've um, defined a way to put these, this data together, we can start thinking about an interface, and this is unfortunately terribly reproduced. The white on black looks really great on your device, but not so good in a projector with the lights on. Um, the one thing you can see, that, so this is basically the main menu of the mobile molecular data sheet. Now, one thing you can see is that there are horizontal lines um, across, across the screen, and each of these represents an individual data sheet. And uh, if I'll certainly make these slides available later, so you'll be able to see that there are a whole lot of structure icons underneath here, and each of those is a summary of, of, the, of the content that's um, in the individual rows within the data sheet. And hopefully this one is slightly better. Um, you can view an individual data sheet by zooming in and acquiring the detail view. So this is a display type that's more similar to what you're familiar with for viewing SD files a lot of the time. So the structure is shown on the left, and the and, um, text data and, and numbers and so on are summarized on the right. Uh, this is not just for uh, viewing. Um, there's a, there are full editing capabilities for these data sheets, so you can edit any of the structures or the scalar fields. Um, there are also manipulation for the, the rows and so on, so you can you know, add, insert, delete, move, and so on. It, it, all of the basic editing functionality that you would expect. And you can also edit the underlying table structure, so um, you know, organize your, your columns as you see fit. Um, this is a good t as good a time as any to mention that the templates that I was talking about before, they're not hard-coded within the system. The, uh, the template groups that you can use to build up structures, they're just derived from individual data sheets on the mobile device. So if you modify or add to any of these, they'll immediately be reflected in your list of drawing options. So if you have uh, structures that you redraw a lot, you can simply add them into your collection. And they'll just be reflected immediately. <coughs> So moving one step up the food chain, we, can, uh, we, we have editing capabilities for uh, structures and, and data. Um, so we can think about defining a data structure for reactions as well. And in this, in this context, it makes most sense to define the reactions as individual components. So you can see this Wittig reaction that has two reactants, one reagent, and one product. And these are all specified as individual independent pieces rather than having a large sketching canvas, which might be more familiar to PC-based tools. So this is a more lab notebook style format. And in order to provide an editor for this, uh, which you can not see terribly well, but um, essentially we can pull these together and just provide a layout tool, so one reactant, another reactant, and a product. And we just need a simple layout algorithm to display it to the user, and we need a, a panel of menu options for allowing people to e edit any of the individual components. That, that part is fairly straightforward. And these reactions are stored within data sheets on a one row each, so you can use the detail view to uh, view individual rows, and uh, so that's reusing a lot of the, the technology. So we, we have a structure editor and our, our data sheet editor and viewer and so on. This is all um, fitting into place nicely. Um, this, I'm glad I included this slide because you can actually see it. This is the same reaction editor that's um, shown on an iPad in landscape mode. So this, all of this editing stuff works great on a, a small sort of palm-sized iPhone device. But it's these um, things like the reaction editor, which can really use a lot more space. And so it's a m much more pleasant to use on an, on an iPad. You don't find yourself zooming in quite so much. And you can make slides that actually display properly. Uh, another feature, so uh, these reactions are defined mainly by structure and name. Uh, but the reactants and products also have an additional stoichiometry field. And this is something that Steve already mentioned. Um, so you can, um, if you provide this stoichiometry correctly, the reaction will be balanced. And if it's not, um, the tool will actually display some leftover atoms. So you can't see that at all, but there are some atoms listed here and here that are, uh, it's just telling the molecular formula of what's left over after canceling both sides out against each other. So you can see very quickly if you've got your reaction balanced or not. And there's a, a panel for specifying the individual um, uh, stoichiometries, or you can just hit the question mark button, and it'll, it'll take its best shot at guessing. 
Okay, so all of this is so far described uh, things that you can do on the device itself and independent of the rest of the world. Uh, but that's not really very useful unless we can move data in and out and share it with people. And luckily, this is where mobile devices really um, do pretty well. They offer us a lot of options for accomplishing this. And one of the, um, one of the most effective ways is, is um, simple email. So if you select a, uh, a structure or a reaction or a whole data sheet within the, within the app, you can initiate an email and it will include the data in all of the formats that it's capable of handling. So you'll get attachments in all of the, the raw data formats, which includes the MDL um, the formats that everybody can use, you know, MOL, SD file, RxN, and RDF. And also if it's a reaction or a structure, you also get a, a picture included in the um, outgoing email so the recipient can immediately tell what, what it actually is. This is a, a two-way connection. Um, by means of integ um, uh, integrating with the device attachment system. So basically, if you get an email coming in and it has a chemical data type that is recognized either by file extension or the right chemical MIME type, that's uh, another way to do it, um, the, the data type will be recognized. And if you ta open it, you'll get this little open in MMDS. That's short for Mobile Molecular Data Sheet. And if you activate that, it will open up the app and it will present to you the data in an editable form immediately. So just basically tap it once and you've got it just as if you drew it yourself. And this, is not, this communication is not limited to two people who are both using this app. If some, somebody sends you a random mole file, you can, um, it will recognize that as a, as a known data type and you'll be able to integrate that into your collection just by selecting it. The attachment mechanism is kind of a two-for-one bonus feature because it also uses the same system for um, mobile browsing. So say, if, for example, we're um, using our mobile browser to uh, wander around something like, say, ChemSpider. And if we hit the Save button for a molecule that we've tracked down by some means, we'll be presented with this uh, similar little, little uh, pre-download display. And you see Open in MMDS here, very similar to the email attachment. So if you hit that button, it'll open up the app and you'll have your data right there in an editable form. So the color scheme's a bit off here, but you can see that this uh, structure is exactly the same one that was downloaded from the web page. So that's kind of a, an example of loosely coupled web services access. Um, it, the, on, the, on the other end of the scale of the same subject is a very specifically designed web services feature which is built into this app. And the way this works is that you need a custom designed web service that speaks a, a special protocol, which is very simple. And if you activate this, so you select the service, the web service will then uh, send out the list of parameters that it needs to do whatever it does. And then the mobile device will use those parameters to compose a form here. It's, you can almost sort of see that, but this is an example of PubChem searching. It's a, it's a web service for searching this database. And it requires a structure, which you can provide within the form, and it also requires a search type. So when you're done providing this information, you submit the form back to the web service, and it will grind away and do whatever it has to do. And eventually, it will compose together a result in the form of a data sheet, which you can't see here. But this is a sort of an SD file style display that has the, the results of this particular structure search. And these web services are quite easy to build yourself. That, that was the um, intention of designing this. The protocol is just a simple XML-based message system. Um, there, it's all documented, and there are PHP examples that you can throw together. There are two publicly available services that you can use right now, and they're for PubCam and Chibi. And both of these services, um, they're just intermedia intermediaries for the real web services that do the actual work. So these, these wrappers basically package up the mobile format. They send it off to the... The, to the proper web service and then they just repackage the results and they make it available to your mobile device. And so these, for, in these two examples, the, the results you get for each head are basically structure and name and a URL for the, to access the, the full data that as, as the original vendor intended. And you can easily access this by a simple menu item which um, shows itself whenever there's a URL encoded in one of these um, columns. And so this is one, you know, one, one good example for building services here would be a, a chemical catalog which you can search, and that, that's the two examples I have. But really it doesn't matter what it does in the back end. It takes a, a customized um, collection of parameters and then um, builds a result and communicates that to you when it's done. 
Um, these mobile devices, they can also transfer raw files. I won't talk about that much. It's not terribly interesting, but the Black it works much better on the BlackBerry version, which gives you full access to the file system, whereas the uh, Apple version is a little bit more inconvenient. You have to go through the iTunes, but you can still pass files back and forth as necessary. Uh, we have some really interesting opportunities that Steve mentioned in the previous talk for um, having these apps actually talk together. And Chances are you, well, there's a fair chance you may have more than one chemistry app on your device. And there's no reason not to since some of them are free. And so whenever you place a, a structure fragment on the clipboard, it can be read by any other application that understands it. Um, there are various formats that you can copy to the clipboard, including MDL, MOL, and Smile strings. Smiles is particularly useful for pasting into the, um, the mobile browser. Uh, you can also paste in images. Um, of, of reactions and molecules, and that's, um, that's uh, quite a key feature here because if you're actually trying to assemble some kind of graphical presentation and you just want to use your mobile device only, you can do that within the mobile, the chemistry app, and then paste it into something like Keynote. Um, I'm actually presenting this on a regular MacBook, but I actually designed this whole presentation using um, Keynote for iPad, and some of the graphics were just designed like this as copy, switch task, paste. So this is one step towards making these devices into tools that you can actually use to do all of your work instead of having to come back to a PC every once in a while. One other thing we can do is actually launch other apps, and that's pretty simple to do. And we can communicate information to them by the clipboard. So this is an ex very simple to what Steve showed before. If you're in the mobile molecular data sheet, you select a structure and you'll get the search MoBridge uh, menu item. That if you select that, it fires up the um, mobile reagents app and tells it to do a substructure search on your selected structure, and hopefully you'll get some nice results popping up so that the other application pops up into the foreground and you can navigate the results. So all of these, uh, all of this uh, describes uh, features that's in this one um, particular app, which is turning into a bit of a Swiss Army knife of um, feature collected features. But there's also a now. Um, and as a result of our collaboration with Hydrogen Certainty, there's an embedded library form which encapsulates some of the key tools, like the structure editor and reaction editing and a few other pieces. And so the, the, um, the first tests of this embedded functionality were the mobile reagents and iProtein apps, which you've seen in the previous talk. And they both make use of some of this, um, a subset of this functionality. And more recently, uh, we've gotten together and designed this Reaction 101 app, which you've already seen a demo for. And this is kind of an experimental um, idea to, to combine a focused subset of all of these mobile features with a, a bunch of powerful server-side functionality from Hydrogen Certainty and sort of bring it together as, a, as an app that's a bit simpler and more interesting to, um, to the student market and education in general. So, um, this, is a, this is a pretty recent development, but we're, we're pretty pleased by the favorable response so far, and we um, do intend to pursue this avenue further. So that's, um, that's the end of everything that you can um, buy right now that I'm going to talk about. Um, up until this, this time, this is all pretty, it's a pretty new field, trying to squeeze all of this technology onto mobile devices. And so the real priority up until now has been to just, to just to get these things working, to figure out what has to be done to move these user interface ideas onto a mobile device and, and, and get it working well, so make, make sure these things are actually very pleasant to use and that they, they work together very effectively. But that now that this is getting closer to a mission accomplished, we're starting to think more about where these tools are actually going to fit into a real-world workflow. So you know, can you actually do real chemical research with a, with a mobile device? Um, and I, I would say the answer so far is, is, is kind of, but uh, we're, getting, we're getting much closer as, as time goes by. And so some of the ideas that are floating around on the table right now is obviously these custom web services, which I was referring to. Um, there's a lot of potential to build new tools there. Uh, you may have noticed that the reaction editor is looking, starting to look a bit like a lightweight electronic lab notebook client, and that's, that's an entirely deliberate um, non-coincidence. And also, we've already started building specialized tools out of pieces of this technology, just focused on quite specific areas to, to enable people to use these devices for things that are really useful. Just a few more slides. Um, one, one of the uh, work, uh, work in progress right now is based on the idea that, well, we've already um, managed to bring a lot of these tools to a mobile context, so they become much more accessible. 
Um, the next thing, logical thing to do is to make the data more accessible as well. So that's this project called, uh, tentatively called MOLSYNC, which is kind of a, a, basically a document versioning system for chemical data. So at the moment, if you have one of these apps on your mobile device, all of your data will be on the actual device itself. So uh, you, you can share it in various ways, but really the central repository is the thing that you're holding in your hand. Once this, <coughs> once this new feature is available, you have the option of synchronizing your data with a cloud-based hosted service. So you'll have, um, you'll, you'll have a version of the, of the centralized data on your device and you'll be able to update it and upload changes um, and download changes that other devices have made to this, this centralized data set. And so you'd be able to connect any number of your own devices to this, this centralized service. And there's also a standard web-based interface that's under, underway right now, which will basically means whether you have this device or not, all you need is an internet connection and you'll have access to your data. The elephant in the living room, which um, I feel obliged to mention, is that, um, okay, right now it's, it's well known that Apple pretty much owns this App Store thing in terms of um, pushing money around. But the competition is pretty fierce, and that's probably not going to last forever. So it's going to be necessary to support a few more platforms than just one or two. And unfortunately, there are quite a few of these. It's, it's the Wild West of um, software development. And it seems like every six months a new one gets added and an old one gets dropped off. And the worst thing is that these, these uh, platforms are completely incompatible with, for, from a source code point of view for all effective purposes. You can't, you can't really share much code at all. It's, it's, they're, they're quite different. And so the only thing that these devices actually all have in common is, is a pretty good implementation of HTML5. So the, um, the, the future in terms of remaining sane and um, you know, supporting everybody in a, in a niche market like chemistry is, it may well just be to port these, um, these mobile tools into JavaScript. And that's, that's a pretty big job, but there's already some, um, some work underway in that, that regard. So I'd just uh, like to do acknowledgements quickly. Uh, Steve Muskell, obviously, the, um, one of my main collaborators, and Maurizio, who's not here today. And there are a list of other people who have, some of the people who have been uh, helpful or inspirational at some point, but that's, uh, that's a subset of all, of all of the people who have contributed. And I would like to thank you for listening. Identification of HTML5. I think this is actually going to save us. Yes, you may. In another project called Scholarly HTML, we see this as getting us away from all this plethora of complex documents. If we return uh, to 1993, 1992, HTML was the way of communicating, and HTML will be the way of communicating. I think you're probably right. <laughs> Um, the question was, uh, will these custom web services be hosted on um, any particular server? Um, th the answer is you can host it wherever you want. So I've, um, I don't intend to um, ask the PubChem guys to host their own because the wrapper that uh, my company provides is, is very low bandwidth, so it's not really any trouble to forward it on to them. Um, it's, it's simply a matter of, of personal preference. Um, you, the, you, you can build these things out of PHP just by cutting and pasting code from my company's website. So if, if you want to, um, uh, the, the answer is yes, yes to both, both options. Um, if you want to host your own ones on a private server or if you want to have a large public server or you know, collaborate with my company to define a, um, a special area to host these, th these options are all available. Um, the, the lab notebook option, it's, uh, it's not heavily developed at the moment. The, the reaction editor is, um, you, it allows you to define um, the, the, basic, the basic elements of the reaction itself, so, and you can annotate it and so on. Um, it is possible to pass this information back, back and forth using web services information, but it, um, the idea of actually integrating it with a, with a, um, a full lab notebook system uh, would require an API running on the server side and um, some, some more customization of, of the client. So it's, uh, um, it's kind of a, a, dangling, a dangling opportunity there. Um, so the, the editor is all done, and we have a data structure that can encapsulate the basic information. But in order to make it, you know, of, of the same sort of power as, as what you would expect from a full lab notebook, there is more work to do there. Um, 
I'm going to ask two questions, if I may, as chair. Um, first is I've been perpetually mystified by a very strange concept, which, as a non-developer, I've never at all understood, and that's the clipboard. So you've got apps communicating via the clipboard. Now, what goes on to the clipboard? Is it obstructed information? Can any app get hold of the specification? I mean, what is this mysterious entity? And does the clipboard only communicate between your apps, or can any app acquire the information on it? Right. I, I think everybody probably heard that. Um, the question is about the clipboard and, and what are its properties and what can you do. Um, it, it is unfortunately very platform specific, but I can answer that question for the, the iPhone devices, for instance. You more or less have two major options. You can put text on it, which is not annotated. So um, if somebody, some other app can just grab it and try and parse it. So you, you, you look at this text, it might be a mole file, it might be um, someone's name, it might be a smile string. And the apps just have to do their best to try and figure it out. It's pretty much, that, that procedure is pretty much the same in the, in the PC world because we haven't really defined any really good identifier mechanisms for labeling our data. Uh, for, and MIME, chemical MIME is not really very well used in this, this clipboard environment. Um, alternatively, some, a lot of platforms also let you paste images in a structured format. So that, you know, bitmap images actually work properly, but everything else is basically raw text, and it's up to the... XML, text, yeah, of course. Right, of course, um, and you know, XML is easy to recognize um, as opposed to a MOL file, which is very quite difficult to recognize. That's the first answer I was hoping to get. The second answer is do you have 10 giveaways or X number of giveaways? Because I noticed that your product is a little bit more expensive than the last one. But since we had half the audience walked out, maybe uh, you, know, that, that, that you don't have to answer. The, the answer to that is um, ask me nicely, you never know. <laughs> I'll buy it much. <laughs> Um, any more questions? Well, actually, uh, I think we've had a very interesting morning session of two different cultures, if you like, coming together, I think, near the end. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers that contributed to these two cultures.